Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, just to let you all know that our entrants and participants have been muted just to avoid the camera switching around. So um, you can ultimately unmute yourself, but I would, if you don't mind, advise against that just so that in the event anybody's dog is barking in the background, the uh, camera doesn't switch from speakers uh, to yourself. So um, we'll get matters moving uh, now. So thank you again for joining the King's Chambers Property Group uh, seminar, the first uh, snappily titled Friday Forum on a Thursday. Uh, we hope it's the first of many, and uh, as I say, thank you for joining us. I'm delighted that we have with us today Nigel Clayton, Richard Lander, Matthew Hall, and Garant Wheatley, some leading uh, property council uh, in the North. The format will be discussion-based as best it can, but given the excellent numbers attending, it may prove a little difficult uh, to have a, a regular dialogue uh, during and in between speakers. So what um, we're suggesting is a couple of things, if you could just take note of before we start, uh, that will hopefully allow for a free and uh, smooth uh, free flowing session. Can I please actually just keep your microphone muted, as I mentioned, uh, so the camera remains on the speakers. I think most of you probably be familiar with Zoom. <laughs> the camera can be very sensitive to any noise uh, in the background and switch focus quite quickly. Um, due to the numbers attending, the roundtable discussion may be a little difficult, but what we'll hopefully do is open up a virtual floor or open up to the virtual floor so that you, so that you can use the chat option at the bottom of your screen at the end of each speaker. So uh, for those who aren't perhaps so familiar with Zoom, you'll find at the bottom of your screen um, the chat button. Uh, and on there, you can message either the individual speakers or everybody. So perhaps bear in mind that um, it will be seen by everybody. But what we'll hope by seeing that is that same questions won't be repeated over and over and it will allow for quicker question answering at the end of each session. So uh, that's really all I need to mention in that sense. Um, all material that will be displayed by some of the speakers will be circulated after the session. Um, so don't worry about that. You can ask questions beyond today any, in any event. But as I say, the um, material will be circulated immediately after the session. So we expect the session to last around 40 minutes um, and that will allow for some questions as well in between sessions. So uh, we hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, I will hand over to Nigel Clayton to commence matters. Thanks, Gary. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Big warm welcome from me. Um, I've got to say, just looking at the screen, there is something surreal about joining you in your homes on a Thursday afternoon. But I guess this is the way it's going to be for a while, but it's really good to have you all with us. Um, big warm welcome. I'm coming to you live from sunny Hebden Bridge in West Yorkshire. It's splendid isolation country up here, if you've ever thought about coming up here. But again, good to have you with us. Um, I've got to begin with a few kind of apologies, first of all, about why this is called the Friday Forum. Um, you probably noticed, first of all, it's not actually a Friday. Um, if you've ever attended one of our property seminars in Chambers, you know that we kind of adopt um, quite an easygoing, chatty, informal style. And we really wanted to kind of recreate that in a sort of a Friday feel open forum. But then I think um, it was probably the clerks, it's always the clerks, I think they fixed this for a Thursday. So in my wisdom, I said, right, we're going to still call it the Friday Forum on a Thursday. So apologies for that. I think the next one's probably going to be on a Wednesday. So don't let that throw you. Um, second, again, this is a big learning curve for us all. We had intended to have an open discussion forum where everybody could have a chat, we could all toss some ideas about, but we had a, an almost perfect disastrous practice run yesterday in Chambers and we realised that it just wasn't possible. So the net result is you're all muted, which isn't great, but um, as Gary said, we're going to try and take, I think, through the chat option at the bottom of the screen, any written quick queries you've got and the other guys here Matthew, Richard, Geraint will keep an eye on those whilst I'm speaking and we'll try and do our best to get around to them. Um, I've got to say the technology on this may be beyond most of us barristers so kind of do bear with us on this um, but as always um, 
if you need us on any property matters at all, um, you know how to get in touch with us in chambers. Um, although we're each going to talk about particular property topics in a second, and we're going to be quite brief, we all cover the same property stuff in chambers. So please come to any of us for, uh, for queries. I'll start off on residential possessions. Um, a bit of an introduction, first of all. If, like me, you've probably been overwhelmed in the last three or so weeks with a massive amount of information being circulated by government, by the courts, by professional bodies, and by various other sources about managing the impact of coronavirus in our sort of daily lives. And not surprisingly, keeping a roof over our heads has been uh, fairly near the top of the agenda. Now, the approach taken in respect of residential mortgages uh, and the approach taken in respect of private rented properties has started off in different ways, but it has effectively converged. And I'll explain why in a second. Um, so I'll go on and summarise the position that's been reached and in particular where we're likely to be going in the future. So mortgages, first of all, um, you may be aware that the government um, initially left it to mortgage lenders to offer a three month mortgage payment holiday. And I think that's largely been achieved in practice. I know that different mortgage lenders have adopted different practices. Some have offered standard three month holidays as a matter of course. Others have taken applications, considered them on the merits and so on. But it has been backed by some fairly stiff firm advice from the FCA. And they've also published fairly recently guidance on repossessions. So if you ever have a sleepless night and want to go on the FCA website, uh, look on the right hand side under firms in blue, you'll, you'll see some guidance marked mortgage and coronavirus guidance for firms. But it does say this, which is quite firm. Uh, in respect of repossessions, firms should not commence or continue repossession proceedings against customers at this time. Where a repossession order has already been obtained, firms should refrain from enforcing it. We consider that commencing or continuing repossession proceedings at this time is very likely to contravene principle six. Now that's a duty to treat customers fairly. So that's how mortgages started off. Um, residential landlord and tenant, um, you're probably all aware now that the government passed um, in record time emergency legislation, the Coronavirus Act uh, 2020, came into force 26th of March. Um, and it dealt with a whole range of um, issues facing us all in our daily lives, but tucked away at Section 81, Schedule 29, uh, were provisions about notice period in residential notices to quit. I just pause and note as well, there is a, an extra provision in section 82, which I think Richard may just avert to, about forfeiture of business tenancies as well. So in summary, on residential uh, landlord and tenant, sh Schedule 29 applies to a range of residential notices to quit, served in what's called, and I quote, the relevant period, that's 27th of March to the 30th of September. So that's a six month block that it applies to. And what it does, it, it extends the date on which notices are to take effect to three months after the date on which they're served. And so, for example, that applies to our standard section 21 notices to terminate assured short held tenancies. It applies to standard section eight notices of proceedings for assured tenancies. And incidentally, the forms of notice have now also been amended. But you can find those on the gov.uk website. And incidentally, they are noted in the written notes that are available after this, uh, this Zoom meeting. I just mentioned in passing as well, Schedule 29 also foreshadows what might be needed in the future. Uh, by containing a rulemaking power to extend the relevant period, but also to extend the three month block period on the notices for an, another period up to six months. So do watch this space with those provisions. I said before that things have converged together because um, in respect of court proceedings generally, uh, 
uh, the restrictions on both mortgage possessions and residential landlord and tenant possessions uh, have since been firmed up by the court. Uh, and you may now be aware of practice direction 51Z, um, a stay of possession proceedings which came into force on the 26th of March. Interestingly, it's expressed to be a time limited practice direction initially to 30th of October 2020. And all it simply says is that all proceedings for possession brought into CPR 55 and all proceedings seeking to enforce an order of possession by a warrant or writ are stayed for a period of 90 days from the date this direction comes into force. Now that's what's happened. Um, just make a few final comments on this. Um, in my experience from speaking particularly to lenders, mortgage lenders, I think all proceedings for possession um, are being in interpreted fairly widely by the court. The indications I'm getting are that the courts are literally staying all part 55 proceedings at almost any stage in those proceedings. And for example, I was briefed by a mortgage lender last week to defend an application to set aside a possession order uh, granted in 2007. And we'd actually agreed that we wouldn't proceed to seek possession if we were uh, successful. But the court simply stayed it for 90 days. It didn't even look at the merits of the application. So I think my practical advice is that if you are uh, involved in part 55 proceedings, either take a sensible and commercial view on what's going to happen or at least speak to the court and see what they're going to do. Um, and do bear in mind, of course, that as you're probably aware now, all courts seem to be doing their own thing, having regard to the resources they've got available to them. So final point, what's likely to happen in the future? Well, the short answer is no one really knows. And I suspect a lot's going to depend on how borrowers and residential tenants come out of this at the other end. Um, do look out for further guidance from government, from statutory agencies. Uh, do look to those practice directions and statutory provisions for extensions in the notice periods or the stay on proceedings. And do look out generally for further legislation generally. I think there, we, there is going to be more to come on this, frankly. I think as well that the reality is that uh, even allowing for concessions on money and time, there is going to be a backlog of these arrears-based claims building up. And so at some point, um, we as lawyers are going to have to sift those and decide which claims we're going to deal with, how we're going to deal with them, and also to manage the merits of those claims. Um, again, I expect the courts are going to be reasonably sympathetic uh, when we come out of this to trying to ascertain which of these cases involve people who can't pay and which of them won't pay. Um, but I do expect quite a bit of tolerance from the courts in the future. So that's it from me on, uh, on residential possessions. Um, I'm not aware, just looking at my chat feature, of any questions coming. And that's great. No questions. Uh, they're storing them all for Geraint at the end, I think. Um, so I'll pass over to Richard Lander, who is uh, going to talk about options for commercial landlords and tenants who are in financial difficulties. Richard. Uh, good afternoon. I, I'm not actually in Majorca, but uh, putting up a virtual background saved me uh, from having to tidy up. Um, you've probably seen it not look at me anyway, so I've done a few uh, slides, which hopefully um, I can uh, get up on the uh, on the screen any moment now. Um, and hopefully people can see the uh, the slides there. So I, I'm going to talk about um, can't pay, won't pay, uh, and about the sort of advice that you might be giving to commercial landlords whose tenants have come to them saying that they can't pay. Now, there's a lot to say on this. It's going to be a pretty much a, a whistle-stop tour. Um, but the uh, landlords are going to fall into two categories. First of all, you may find that the landlord is helpful and wants to uh, do a deal with the tenant. And uh, if that's the case, just a few uh, tips uh, for any such deal. Um, 
Now, there are, after this coronavirus pandemic has passed, going to be all sorts of arguments about the extent of rent concessions that landlords have made. Uh, and the key tip is keep it certain. First of all, as to the duration of any concession, um, we probably all from university remember the High Trees case, which was the, the, really the start of um, uh, these uh, concession cases. Uh, and the agreement there, I've put it on the slide, uh, we confirm that the arrangement made between us by which the ground rent should be reduced as from the commencement of the lease to £1,250 per annum. Now, that led in argument to the, um, the landlord say it wasn't valid at all. Uh, and the uh, tenant said, well, in actual fact, no, that's for the whole of the lease. And it was Lord Denning that came to the rescue and said, well, it's actually... Uh, until such time as the block became fully occupied, whether or not that was before the end of the war, which was probably clearer to him than anybody else, but uh, that's the sort of argument you're opening yourself up to. Uh, secondly, is the obligation to pay waived or is it just suspended? Need to make that clear. Uh, and then thirdly, sometimes there will be people who are granting a new tenancy at a low rent um, and in those circumstances, you've got to, again, make sure that the term is certain from the outset. Uh, Lace and Chandler was a, a, a lease for the duration of the war, void for uncertainty. And then you get all sorts of uncertain things uh, coming in, like um, either a periodic tenancy, tenancy at will. There'll be all sorts of arguments about it. Not all landlords will be quite that impressed. And uh, so uh, what happens if your landlord comes and says, well, I, I want my rent. I don't care uh, what difficulties my uh, tenant is in. Um, now, the advice that you would uh, give there is the headline news everybody's seen. And uh, Nigel referred to a few minutes ago. The government has given protection to tenants by suspending forfeiture by court action or physical reentry until the 30th of June but with the possibility of a further extension. Uh, now, there's a lot that's been written on that, and uh, I'm not going to say a, a great deal uh, about how that works mechanically. But when you're advising your landlord, really there's a question, first of all, do you really want to forfeit anyway at the moment? Because the obvious consequence of forfeiture is that the lease comes to an end and I've set out on the slide the again the obvious consequences uh, of that. Now forfeiture is great if you have a queue of potential tenants lining up two meters apart to um, try and uh, take a new lease at a decent rent but is that really what's going to happen at the moment? Is that realistic? So forfeiture the loss of the ability to forfeit in most cases at the moment is no great loss. So that's the, the negative for the landlord. You can't forfeit at the moment. But, but these are on paper, the positives. Uh, first of all, the Act only suspends the right to forfeit. And then only for rent and other payments, not for other types of forfeiture. It doesn't suspend the obligation to pay the rent. It doesn't suspend any other enforcement method, but it does suspend waiver of forfeiture, say for an express waiver in writing. Uh, and I'll come back to that in, in right at the end. But what are the other enforcement methods that that leaves a landlord uh, with? Well, first of all, you can issue an ordinary claim. Now that's, uh, you can issue it reasonably uh, easily by doing it online, but when will it get to be heard? Uh, you're probably all aware that the civil courts have uh, given out, a doc uh, have produced a document with uh, listing priorities, and it has to be said that commercial rent claims are not at the top of that list. So it's going to be a long time before you get to see any money uh, if you issue a claim. Uh, secondly, th there's been a lot written on commercial rent arrears recovery. Again, if you, if you Google that, you'll find no end of articles and they'll all say, well, that landlords can still um, uh, use this, which 
I'm sure you're all aware, is really the, the statutory replacement for distress, uh, provided landlords with a, a more regulated method of taking the tenants' goods, selling them and keeping the cash. But again, on paper, that sounds fine. But the problem is that there are no civil enforcement officers to go to the premises to seize the goods. Uh, and there's a, a trade body that most of these civil enforcement officers belong to called the Civil Enforcement Agency. And if you look on their website, there's a, a, a press uh, a statement that came out pretty promptly after the uh, coronavirus uh, problem blew up saying there has been a complete suspension of enforcement visits and, and that still holds good. There's nobody that is going to go to the premises to seize the goods. So that really doesn't help you enormously. Now the other way of uh, dealing uh, with it, which is normally reasonably prompt, is um, to serve a statutory demand and then follow that with a winding up petition or of course a bankruptcy petition if uh, it's, a, it's an individual. Now the statutory demand itself gives three weeks to pay after which you can present your winding up petition. Now, again, that is something that is going to involve uh, the court um, and uh, the court is going to have to uh, issue the petition before you can serve it. How long is the court going to uh, take to deal with this? Now the court, in order to issue the petition, is, has to set a date for the hearing the practice direction uh, says how those hearings are going to take place by way of um, uh, video hearings. Uh, and you, you may or may not be aware there's a temporary insolvency practice direction and a northern variation to it. But the reality is, I have no immediate experience of this, but I don't think the court is going to be particularly quick to actually get on and uh, give you the petition that you can serve. Uh, and then can you serve it? Again, potential problem, who's going to do it? Uh, you've then got to advertise it. Now, if you get this far, and that's seven days, seven business days after service, then that's uh, quite serious for the tenant because as soon as the petition is advertised, the bank account is likely to be frozen, which is a big threat to uh, tenants. And, and if you can get this far, then that may well lead to them um, uh, finding the money. If, of course, you get past that point, you get to the hearing of the petition and you've got another potential problem uh, there, which is that it's a nuclear option. If you end up winding up the company, you're not going to get your money in any great hurry if you get it at all. And so um, really the, what I think the, the best way of uh, dealing with it by way of um, this sort of um, uh, procedure is to get to step D advertisement or get before step D and say unless you pay within a certain period of time then you know this is going to be the the, the advertisement procedure is going to have to follow uh, and that's that's really the threat. Now the, the real problem isn't that there are legal impediments to uh, actually getting on and enforcing the claims for rent but like the toilet rolls in the picture you just can't get hold of what you want and there's no evidence that I've seen that that's an issue that's going to go away um, particularly quickly. Uh, finally, I said I'd say something about the uh, suspension of, uh, of waiver. Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, the, the usual problem that landlords face is that if rent is payable in advance, the landlord loses the right to forfeit for um, a, an instalment if after that rent's become uh, due, it takes any of the other steps to try and enforce the payment, because that's only consistent with the continuation of the lease. Uh, not for now, because waiver is suspended except for express waiver. Now that does give the landlord the opportunity to try out the other enforcement actions and see how far they can get, and then come back to forfeiture when suspension is lifted. So for instance, uh, you can serve your statutory demand uh, which otherwise might be a waiver of the uh, of the forfeiture. So that's the one. That's the one positive. When the um, waiver, um, when the suspension of waiver comes to an end, there are going to be all sorts of arguments 
about uh, whether there has been a waiver uh, if forfeiture isn't carried out promptly. So landlords, I think, are going to need to be aware that um, come the end of this suspension period, they're going to need to act quickly if they want to forfeit, if in the meantime they have been trying out other uh, forms of, uh, forms of uh, rent recovery. Now that's, I've run out of time, that's all I'm going to uh, say. I'm going to hand over to uh, Matthew Hall now, he's going to talk on frustration. Uh, he's been my roommate for a number of years, so uh, he's probably a bit of an expert on frustration. Uh, thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, I'm just going to see if I can get my uh, um, talk up on the screen, if I can, just wait a second. Okay, um, I'm hoping you can, people can see that anyway. Um, so yes, frustration. And Matthew, Matthew sorry topic. to interrupt, it's a bit small. Ah, right, okay, let's see if I can, thank you Geraint. Uh, is that better? Yep, it is. Yeah. Great. Can you read? Can you read the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, right. Don't want to miss any of that. Okay. Just to start off, then um, you might be asked, I suppose, um, by a client, can I say that my lease is frustrated? I've got no use for my premises at the moment. Or you might be advising a landlord. Uh, faced with a claim that that's the case. Just to recap then quickly, uh, what is frustration? Well, there are three discernible main ingredients. Firstly, some sort of supervening thing that happens, uh, and that has to affect either the possibility or practicability sometimes of performance, or um, the fundamental purpose uh, of the contract. Uh, that thing uh, that is the supervening event can't, though, be um, brought about or caused by the deliberate act, uh, still less the fault of either of the parties. And uh, the third thing is that the parties can't have provided for that thing happening in the contract itself. Now, that could be an express uh, force majeure clause or it could be um, just something that's obvious from the circumstances of, of, of the contract, such as so, so that there's been an obvious allocation uh, of the risk. Um, now, this is the uh, classical definition of uh, the sort of thing uh, that can, or the test for the sort of thing that can be a supervening event frustrating a contract. It's uh, Viscount Radcliffe, and it, the, the crucial part there is that the, it renders uh, performance a radically different thing from that which was undertaken. And then uh, his lordship quotes from uh, um, the Latin, non haec in fidera veni. He says, it was not this that I promised to do. Um, now, um, the starting point for, for, for contracts generally um, is that where there is a contract to provide a thing or a service, um, a change of events um, uh, which prevents the recipient putting to use that thing or service does not um, frustrate the contract. And the famous example that was given by the judge in the Krell and Henry case that I've got up there is if, if I hire a, a, a handsome cab to go to Epsom and the racing is cancelled, it doesn't mean that I don't have to pay the cab driver. Uh, Krell and Henry was one of those coronation cases. Uh, so uh, Mr. Henry rented a room on Pall Mall to watch the uh, coronation procession. And the question was whether he had to um, pay the contract hire when the procession was cancelled due to the illness of the king. And uh, the court, Found that he didn't. Um, now, that really raises the question. It's always very difficult for the courts to answer this question. What is it that's the subject matter of the contract? Uh, what is the what is the thing that I promised to do in the in the terminology of Viscount Radcliffe? Uh, is is Mr. Uh, Henry simply renting a flat, or is he renting a flat to watch the King's procession? 
That's a very difficult question. And it, it's always impossible in many cases to uh, predict what the answer is going to be. In the summer of 1903, uh, these coronation cases came before the court. And there was another one, uh, not Krell and Henry, another case, uh, Hearn Bay Steam uh, Company and Harris, where the same court found that somebody who'd hired a boat to go and watch the naval review, which was happening as part of the procession, did have to pay. It's very difficult when you read those cases to make the distinction between the two. Starting point for leases is very similar. Um, the, the traditional stance is the lease is a lease, it's an estate in land. The purpose for which you put that land is irrelevant. And that was uh, Paradigm and Jane. That's the traditional uh, view. Uh, the, the problem, I think, with Paradigm and Jane, obviously it's very old, but it, that was decided before the doctrine of frustration had even been uh, invented. Um, but it was a case where the tenant had had his land occupied by the, in, the uh, forces of uh, King Charles, Prince Rupert's army, and hadn't been able to use them for the previous three years of the term. We then come on to the House of Lords case from 1981, which decided that frustration did, in fact, apply to leases. And that this is the starting point if you, this question ever comes up. Um, you'll be looking at this case, you'll be able to see that it was a 10 year lease. Uh, about four and a half years in, into it, the council shut the road to the warehouse, which was the subject of the demise. And um, at the time, it looked, and that cut off all access, by the way, not, not even pedestrians could get through. At the time they did it, it looked like the, the, the road would be shut for a year. Um, in fact, it was about 20 months. And by the time the, the case had come on to come into the House of Lords, uh, the period was nearly over uh, and it looked like the tenant was, uh, was going to get the remaining three years or so of its term. House of Lords said, well, there's no reason in principle why frustration can't apply to leases. And they said it would be a, a, a rare event that this would um, be um, arguable uh, where it was a lease. Um, to back that up, there were an, a number of previous cases where the doctrine hadn't been successfully relied on, were expressly approved. And one of them in particular is worth just mentioning because it's quite a good one, just as a simple um, example of the sort of things that can happen. It's um, Mr. Schlesling, Schlesinger and his flat in Westcliff on Sea. Um, law, um, regulations were passed on the outbreak of World War I, um, prohibiting um, enemy aliens, as they were called, from living, um, living in certain areas. I assume it was by the seaside, so they couldn't keep a watch on naval movements or something like that, but there we are. Um, now he said, well, I, I don't have, my lease of my flat is frustrated because I can't live there. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm at, the lease itself is not illegal, but I can't live in that flat. And the, the judge uh, threw that out. Um, the fact was that he was able to sublet his flat or even just keep his possessions there. Now, interestingly, there is no reported case yet in which a lease uh, um, has been found to have been frustrated. I don't know if anyone uh, involved with this wants to be rash enough to be the first in the field to, uh, to, 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 to have a, a, um, a successful attempt. But, um, and you can see why with leases that it's going to be a problem. Firstly, there's this point about subletting uh, and having some use of the premises, even if uh, they can't be used. The other thing is that where there's a long lease, uh, that gives rise to problems like in um, uh, arguments like in uh, the Panalpina case, that there will be some time left after the problem, after the disturbance subsides. And, and clearly as well, with long leases, it, the, the longer the lease, the more likely it is to be arguable that there was an implicit acceptance of risk that you know, whatever happens during a 99 year lease um, uh, isn't really the landlord's problem, for example. 
examples given are, are, are quite dramatic as well. It's convulsions of nature and houses being swallowed up by the sea, which are referred to in, by the judges in the older reported cases. Um, there has been one recent attempt that's, um, that will come up if you do a search, um, Canary Wharf and European Medicines Agency. Basically, European Medicines Agency has the <clears throat> lease of the first 10 floors of the office block you, say, you see there, 13 million pounds a year they're paying. Brexit happens, the European Union relocates the agency to Amsterdam. The agency says, well, that's uh, Brexit is a uh, frustrating event. And um, in my view, perhaps not surprisingly, the uh, judge uh, rejected that argument. It was not, um, uh, he found, um, uh, prohibited for the, um, uh, for the EMA to sublet its premises. Um, and, and indeed, the, the judge found that, the, in fact, this was just a lease where the purpose of the landlord wasn't to let the premises for 25 years to be used by EMA for their purposes carrying on that business of European Medicines Agency. The landlord's objective was simply to get a rent for a fixed term. So um, departing from the Krell and Henry analysis, it was just a lease of the building. Um, in that case, it refers to the multifactorial approach. Um, that's not much of a test, I don't think, but it's what the judges are likely to rely on. But taking everything into account is all that's really saying. I much prefer, I have to say, the rather pithy test of Viscount Radcliffe, which we, which we started on. Sort of arguments that you're going to get then. Um, well, coronavirus, um, I think won't frustrate um, a lease that's got a long time to run. Um, if, it, if there are years and years for it to run, that is. But you can sort, you can easily see that where you have a short lease, or indeed a lease which does not have that long left to run, the tenants are going to be tempted to make the argument. Or um, <clears throat> at, at the moment, we don't know how long this is going to go on for. Uh, there are lots of cases about how you go about assessing um, this. They arise mainly in the charter party scenario. But the, the basic gist of that is that there has to be a sensible prognosis of what the commercial probabilities are going to be. Uh, you would have to have the argument, well, how long is this likely to carry, to carry on? Um, but just as in the Schlesinger case with Mr. Schlesinger and his flat in Westcliff on Sea, if Mr. Schlesinger had been able to say, well, I can't even sublet my flat. There's no, I can't even keep my clothes there. I, there's nothing I can do with it. Then it may well be uh, that in that case, the, the result would have been different. And similarly, in the um, Panalpina case, uh, had the uh, disturbance of the uh, access to the property been due to continue for the whole of the remainder of the lease, it's easy to see the result may well have been different. So I think the tenant's going to have to show that there's essentially nothing that can be done with the premises and that the disturbance is frustrating the rem either the, re the whole term of a short lease or the remainder of, of, of a lease that's all uh, where most of the term has already been passed. Other things to take into account as well, for example, with that are if the, what's the permitted user? I mean, if it's only for a restaurant or some sort of facility that simply can't be run, the tenant may well be tempted to have a pop. There may be other arguments as well about subsidiary obligations within leases, such as um, repairing covenants, um, uh, things like that. It, it, it's not necessary to uh, attack the whole lease. Uh, one might, for example, seek to show that the repairing covenant's been frustrated because it's impossible to carry out any works at the, at the term because you can't send workers in. Um, and the, the other thing is that uh, if you had a contract for a lease um, you, the, and, the, and one party doesn't want to perform and take the lease, it might be possible to argue that specific performance should be refused. Uh, just finally, I just thought I'd do a bit of research as well on where um, Viscount Radcliffe got his 
uh, non-hike in feeder of any. Uh, anyway, it was um, apparently it was Ainas. I don't even know how to pronounce that, but uh, it's from uh, the Ionid by Vigil. And what happens was that Dido, who's a beautiful princess, was trying to persuade the hero Ionas to stay with her in Carthage. She's pleading with him and moaning with him. And in fact, when he left, she, she threw herself on a funeral pyre. So distraught was she. And Ionis's reply to this speech that she made was, that I put in red there, was, well, it's not as if I ever said I would marry you in the first place, is it? The classical, uh, classic and classical response, but that was the translation. I never had that contract with you. Uh, out hike in feeder at Veni. Um, so there you go. That's a more interesting uh, take on the on the on, on that test. Uh, it's better than the multifactorial approach, I think. Um, and that's that. Um, now I think I have to pass over to um, Geraint's next. Um, no one came up on the chat, I don't think, unless I just can't see. But anyway, anyway, if anyone's got any questions. Um, feel free to speak afterwards or um, put it up on the um, on the chat message board. Okay, that's me done. So oh, I have to take this off, don't I? There we go. Okay, um, thank you very much for that, Matt. Um, can everyone hear me? Because I can't see myself. Yeah. Yep, good. Thank you very much. Um, there won't be any classics uh, in my talk, um, which is going to be about break clauses. Um, you've got to love chancery work where you have um, references to cases from 1647 um, as being at the, the cutting edge of, of uh, latest news under the coronavirus outbreak seminar. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, some of the, the questions surrounding break clauses during the pandemic. Um, it's not going to be possible to um, give all of the answers uh, to these questions because they, they don't yet exist really. Um, I, I, searched, I, I looked on Westlaw um, earlier today um, and it, that search showed that the, there have been no urgent cases uh, reported in which COVID has been raised in the context of, of um, leases. I suspect at some point something will, will, um, will feed through. Um, when it does we'll, we'll try to let you all know about it but um, at some point someone will, will issue an application for an urgent declaration about something or other arising out as a, as a result of uh, COVID, but just for the time being nothing. Um, so really the, the idea of, of my talk is to um, raise some ideas and thoughts about break clauses in the current context um, in case you find these issues arising in your practices. And I, and I think that, that they might well arise because at the moment, it's a time of, of enormous uncertainty, um, but I think that what we can be certain of uh, is that, that um, this crisis will lead to a great deal of tension between landlords and tenants. And without cooperation between landlords and tenants, there will be a real uptick in disputes. Whether they reach the court um, is another matter. Um, so whether or not we, we all have to grapple um, on an ever, uh, increasing basis with, with the, the patchwork of um, practice directions and protocols and all sorts of other nonsense that, that um, has been spewing out of um, <laughs> the courts of recent times remains to be seen. Okay, so um, the basic scenario uh, under a break clause, let's imagine there's a 10 year lease uh, of premises with a five year break. Um, I must say this is quite distracting for me because I can see a few thumbnail pictures, but I've got a massive image of Matthew smiling back at me in the centre of my screen. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite unsettling. <laughs> um, so we've got a 10 year lease of premises with a five year break. The tenant ceases business operations um, as a result of the, of the lockdown. And the break clause is typical. It's conditional on the tenant performing its covenants and paying its rent up until the break date. Let's say that, that break date is perhaps six months away uh, and it requires vacant possession to be yielded up. So the first issue, the rent. Uh, as has been touched on already today, the government support for commercial tenants in the Coronavirus Act uh, 
relates to a freeze on forfeiture for non-payment of rent. Now that, um, again, as Richard has mentioned, is a bit of a trap for the unwary. Um, tenants can't just think, well, there we go, uh, I don't need to be paying my rent because the obligation to pay rent continues. And Richard mentioned some of the, the ways in which rent can still, um, the obligation to pay rent can still be enforced. Now that feeds into break clauses too, because as long as, if you've got a condition for complying with a break clause that requires payment of rent up until the break date, and the obligation to pay rent does continue, then tenants aren't sitting pretty thinking, well, we don't need to be paying. If they want to break, they need to be paying their rent. The second condition that I mentioned in our example is to do with the performance of covenants up until the break date. So let's imagine that our premises are in disrepair, the obvious one. How can a tenant comply with that, uh, with that condition? if he can't get a surveyor in to assess the work that needs to be done to put it into the, the state that's required by the repairing covenant. How can a tenant comply um, if he can't get a builder in to, to do the work? On the face of it, if the tenant can't get the work done, the condition can't be satisfied and the tenant will lose the right to break. Other covenants will be less obvious than things like uh, uh, dilapidations. So you've got a covenant perhaps to maintain adequate insurance of the premises and a covenant to adhere to the policy requirements. What if that policy requires that the premises are not left unoccupied for more than a certain number of days? It's easy to see how there'll be an, uh, all manner of covenants that a tenant will be in breach of and as a result potentially unable to comply with the conditionality of the break clause. The third condition in our example was to do with um, vacant possession. And um, the, the, the leading case on this is the NYK um, logistics and iBrand uh, case. And, and essentially, the, the, um, the Court of Appeal take a long time over saying this, um, but basically it means that you've got to have your, the, the premises empty of people and stuff. Um, so let's imagine that our premises are free of people they've got to be because we're, we've all got to be um, at home socially distancing but but our premises have been left full of things it's been let's say it's an office it's full of our tables and chairs and computer equipment all that sort of thing what's a tenant to do in order to be able to give vacant possession at the break date well if it's just tables and chairs and things like that then Subject to possible um, overzealous policing, the, the, um, the tenant can go and get them. The tenant can, can um, say to an employee, I instruct you to go and get this stuff, get the tables and chairs out, put it in a van. Um, you can do it on your own so you're not uh, mixing with other people. And uh, off you go. This is not work that you can do at home. So therefore, you need to go to your workplace and do what I'm telling you. Fine. But what about other things? What about things that, that, that the poor employee can't do uh, by himself or herself? One of my cases at the moment involves some enormous um, million pound boilers to create um, biofuel. Now they, they need specialist contractors to, to move them. So there's no hope of, of just sending uh, someone with a van to sort that out. Huge problems for tenants in complying with, with, with break clauses, any number of covenants that they could be uh, in breach of and not therefore able to, to, to break the lease in theory. So what are the options for a tenant? First of all, always you look to construe the, the break clause itself and some break clauses are restricted. Uh, they're, they're limited rather um, by reference to materiality um, requirements. So they might say that that's, um, you can break the lease if you have materially complied with your um, obligations under the lease, or that you can break the lease if you have reasonably complied with your obligations under the lease. And they make different things. The one that's particularly relevant, I think, in terms of the COVID crisis would be one if your break clause talks about reasonable compliance, because that brings in a certain subjective element. Um, 
And so you, you look at whether the, at the effort that the tenant has made, now that could have relevance to a case in relation to this. But bear in mind that if there's been total non-compliance with clauses, doesn't matter how hard you might try, if you, if you, if you simply haven't complied at all, um, then this argument is unlikely to be available to you. Another possibility is frustration, um, as uh, Matt was talking about. And you'll recall uh, that Matt was talking about frustration possibly being um, a stronger argument in cases where there is a short lease or the lease is nearing its term date. Always tricky to run the argument, but, but perhaps a little bit easier. And that got me thinking as to whether it, by analogy with, with that, you might be able to say that if you're in the, the break period, all being well, the lease will be ending soon. And if the lease is ending soon, are you close to the, 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 the position where, are you in similar territory to the, the, the short leases or lease nearing the, the term date? And bear in mind within all of this that, that a, a break clause is a, is a fundamentally important part of the, of the structure of a lease. The difference between a five-year term and a 10-year term is enormous. The performance of that lease it would be radically different if you're unable to break because of the pandemic. So all of these, these thoughts will feed into the argument to do with frustration. But to be, fr in, to be frank, we, we are in entirely uncharted waters with all of this. My own view on this is that the, that the courts will be hugely sympathetic to tenants facing difficulties with this sort of thing. But they're judges are human beings. You, you, you get some who are all too willing to stick their head above the parapet. But there's a lot of others who will be wary of floodgates. If you, if you are the judge facing the, the decision about allowing um, a tenant to frustrate, to say that the lease has been frustrated due to this, you're potentially opening the, the, the gates to, to a huge number of tenants um, arguing the same thing with huge implications for the, the property investment sector, the wider economy. That will be weighing on judges' minds. Another thing that, that Matt talked about was, was this concept of partial frustration. That might find a home in break clauses too. Because if because of temporary difficulties caused by the, the, by the, the COVID crisis, you can rely on partial for this concept of partial frustration. The tenant could say, well, I should be excused from, I should be temporarily excused from performance of certain covenants in the lease that, that I'm finding difficulty, finding it difficult to comply with. And if those are the covenants that you would otherwise need to comply with in order to break the lease, maybe this is your, this is your way in. It's a really tricky area, this, that there are some doubts in the authorities in the leasehold context as to whether it applies. And as I say, this is a, an entirely novel situation and at some point some new law is likely to be made or at least the, 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 um, the court will, will restate the old position which is that, that it is far too difficult to frustrate anything in the leasehold context. If we do this on a Friday I think we should switch the water for, uh, for beers. The, one of the reasons why it will be really difficult, it seems to me, to, to allow for, for a court to allow a tenant to get out of um, its obligations under a break clause. It's, and this is a bit of a, a basic refresher. Break clauses are options. Options are strictly construed. They amount to conditions precedent. I mentioned before that, that break clauses are a, part, a really significant part of the structure of a lease. So it's to do with the, the commercial balance between the parties. A landlord is basically saying to a tenant, if you don't want to be stuck here for the duration of the, the, of the lease for the full term, I will let you out, but only if you do the following. So that's the, the landlord's offer at the outset of, the, of the, the tenancy. The tenant accepts the lease on those terms. But the, the conditions that are the, uh, that the landlord places on the operation of the break clause, they cast the risk of non-compliance on the tenant. They're saying to the tenant, you can do this if you like, but only if you do X, Y, and Z. 
So all of the risk is on the tenant. And if the, the parties have given thought to this at the, time, at the outset, they have set up a break clause which casts the risk on the tenant, it seems to me that the courts are likely to be very wary of allowing something like frustration to upset that allocation of risk. Similarly, there's been some talk about implied terms and could they be the way forward for tenants? Again, it seems to me it's possible, but you've got to proceed with caution on that. In all contexts, whether it's commercial litigation or property law, implied terms get, get bandied around really easily. It's like people talk about estoppel as if it's the sort of, you know, it's the, the panacea, it's the way we get out of anything. But with implied terms, you've got to ask yourself, what term is it that's being implied? Will it satisfy the tests that are applicable across all um, spheres for the implication of terms? So in this context, what would the implied term be? What about an implied term that the, the break clause or the break date would be deferred until the end of the pandemic? Seems reasonable potentially on the face of it. It seems fair on the face of it, but it's also uncertain, isn't it? Because would the, and you, you ask yourself, would the parties, would particularly the landlord, um, can the landlord be taken to have agreed to a term like that unhesitatingly? Where there is such uncertainty about the duration of, of the pandemic. How about an implied term that the tenant would not have to comply with the break conditions in order to validly break if the tenant is unable to do so for reasons beyond uh, its control? Again, it seems reasonable, seems fair, but again, to me, it seems doubtful. It seems to me to be too broad because it, for a couple of different reasons, first of all, it would cover a situation where absolutely awful dilapidations have been left behind. That's an implied term that would allow a tenant to break, leaving terrible dilapidations, for example, doesn't to me seem likely to satisfy the, the, the test for the implication of terms. It would also cover non COVID situations where one of the requirements is to redecorate um, when you yield up. On the last day before the break date, the decorators in, in his or her overalls walking to, to the premises and gets knocked down, can't complete the job. An implied term like this would, would um, in theory, say, allow the tenant to say, well, I'm sorry, I'm unable for reasons beyond my control to comply with this. So let's just forget about the fact that I had to, I'm supposed to comply and let me break anyway. Um, personally, I, I don't see it um, being particularly viable as an option. Again, we just come back to this idea of commercial risk, the allocation of risk between the parties. Break clauses place that risk on the tenant. So at the end of the day, my view is that, that tenants are going to find it extremely hard um, to, to get out of the need to comply with um, covenants in relation to break clauses. I think, and, and sometimes the courts try as they might, they end up saying that the loss has to lie where it falls. And I suspect that this may well be one of those, uh, those areas. So practically, what can we do? We can advise tenant clients to plan ahead as much as possible. Um, if you've got a break clause, that, that a break date that's six months away, the world could be an entirely different place in six months time. Tenants should try and put things in place as much as possible. They should, they should line up contractors so that they're ready to go. It may be that they can find a sole pr a practitioner surveyor who's prepared to go out and do a survey. So social distancing is not a problem because the tenants left the premises. At least you can get yourself ready. You can send that survey out to contractors to say when you're able to get back on the job, can you go and do this? And that's the sort of practical thing that might allow some tenants to comply by the skin of their teeth. But other than that, it seems to be very tough.